Up next, Scotty Cowling, WA2DFI, is going to give us an update on the high performance software defined radio project, a, a fitting subject after that one. Okay, well, uh, you come to DCC for uh, high tech and innovation. Let's try this out. Some things work and some things don't, as I will uh, get on to explain a little bit later. But since we got two screens, I've never done a presentation with two screens before, but I got two laser pointers, so. <laughs> Let's see now, does this? No, nah, forget it, that won't work. Did you get that on film? So just in case, I'm the first one that ever did that. Okay. Anyway, um, how many people here know uh, about HPSTR, know what it is? Okay, more than half. How about, how many people have Ozzy, Janus, Atlas, HPSTR boards? Okay, well the first part of this is not for you guys. So you can go to the restroom or get some water or get ready for lunch. I'm gonna to try to go kinda of quick through this, so if you have questions, something's not obvious, raise your hand and let me know. Okay, what is HPSDR? Well, it's SDR, the HP stands for high performance. And in general, and this is maybe what Paul was talking about, this is a lot simpler definition than I'm sure he's looking for. But it's not a software controlled radio, it's the demodulation and filtering modulation is in the software, not in hardware. Okay, better known ones that you are familiar with probably, Flex 5000, SDR 1000, or Soft Rocks. And specifically, the HPSDR version of SDR is very high performance, based on open hardware and open software, modular and expandable, and most important, contributes to the advancement of the, of the art of radio. It's kind of what we're all here for, I think. Okay, what's the project? HPSDR project is open source hardware and software, like I said, for developments of components of software defined radio. If you want a, I take it out of the box, I set it down, I plug my antenna in and I get on the air, this is probably not for you. You need to go to Flex and buy one of their radios. But if you want to experiment, learn about SDR, and also be at the forefront of high performance, this then this is for you. And it's run really by a group of volunteers, it's not really an organization like Tapper or AMSAT or ARL, it's basically a bunch of 800 to 1,000 guys that got together, varying experience from engineers, RF guys, digital guys, to guys who say, gee, that's cool, how can I do something with this? How can I play around with this? So varying experience levels. And how's Tapper involved in this, you might ask? Well, we we'll want to support HPSDR with R&D funding and uh, building up some of these things, as you'll come to see in a little bit later here, is uh, cost some money because uh, oftentimes you don't get it right the first time, but I'm saying that really softly so maybe not everyone will hear it. As you'll see, we didn't get it right the first time, but we got it right eventually, so. Early volume production, uh, probably not many of you are willing to shell out all the money necessary to build 500 or something. I know I'm not, so I appreciate the support Tapper gives to this project to allow all of us to have something inexpensive and available and many of them. So what we get out of this is an ever-growing pool of experimenters and contributors. Every new experimenter is a potential contributor and everything's open, all the hardware, all the software. You can see the schematics. You can go build one if you want. You don't have to buy Tapper's board. You don't like the way we, what features we put in? Pick your own, take some out, change it. Anything you want, it's all open. So even though HPSDR and Tapper are separate, we kind of complement each other. So the design and the experimentation and the advancement of the art really belongs to the experimenters on this project, but Tapper's a facilitator. We help get lots of these units out to widen the base. And how about AMSAT? Well, they, can, they help us too. They support HPSDR with software tools. I know, I think it was Bob McGuire that did this, but, uh, or uh, Rick Hambly, they negotiated uh, Two million dollars, I think, was it Steve? Two million dollars worth of tools to be donated to AMSAT for use by not just AMSAT, by the, make them available to developers in general who want to advance the state of the radio art. So schematic capture software, simulation software, PCB layout software, I can't afford to buy all these things. Most of you probably can't either, but you don't have to. 
There's, it's set up on a network type license, so you can get the permissions to use it, you can download the software, and then when you fire it up, the licensing software says, okay, we've got five copies licensed to us, so five people can use it at a time. So it's very flexible and gives you access to software that you wouldn't have otherwise. Also, uh, they support us with uh, SMT re rework equipment, and if you've ever looked at the boards that we got in the demo room, you can tell that you need that. <laughs> it's some of those parts you're not going to get off or put on with uh, normal mortal hands. Also, they uh, helped us with some financial hurdles because in the beginning, it was, we, it still is, it's very expensive to produce these boards, and you have to buy a lot of the parts up front. And a lot of you users out there who bought them helped us with that, but AMSAT helped us with some funding also. Okay, now I get to the meat of things here, the boards. You probably know about these boards here, Atlas, the backplane, six slot backplane. Again, I have this in the demo room if you want to see it. This is a I mean, backplane, it's a backplane, it's passive backplane. It has a connector for a, a PC power supply so you can use your old dead PC's power supply to power it. Although for other reasons you might not want to do that, but at any rate, it's a 20 pin Molex connector that takes a standard PC pin out. Uh, extender card, again, this is a piece of test equipment. You don't really need this uh, like, unless you put the unit in a case, and then you might need that in the future. Uh, Aussie board is a USB gateway. Uh, basically uh, interfaces the Atlas bus to a USB port of your computer. And it's pretty high speed, too. It's USB 2, and uh, they've clocked, I think, in the high 30 megabytes per second range. So it actually does work fast. Uh, Janus. High speed, A to D and D to A to camera. Well, high speed, it's baseband, so it's 192 kilohertz. And uh, basically, it's a sound card for SDRs. Now, you can't use Janus as a regular sound card. It talks to Power SDR software, so you can use it to hook your Rocky to, but you can't use it to play your tunes. You can't play MP3s through it because there's no sound card driver, at least not yet. Uh, Penelope, a half watt transmitter exciter. She uses a direct up conversion, so basically you hang a D to A converter on the bus and you say, what kind of waveform do I want today? And you make it, you build it. Okay, now these are the boards that are already out today, so probably uh, if you're SBR, HPSDR enthusiast, you have these or know of them anyway. So what's next? Mercury, direct sampling front end. This is 122 megabits per second direct sampled RF, so basically this is your antenna goes into the A to D. And I'll get into more details in a minute here. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this. I call it Alex because that's four letter words. Are, I'm, good at, I'm good at that, so. <laughs> but uh, this is a set of RF bandpass filters and this started out to be a very small, uh, simple pre-selector project and it's, turned, it's morphed into something that is uh, truly awesome as you're gonna see in a minute here. Okay, Atlas backplane, this is a picture of it. Six slots, DC in, no regulators, a couple of LEDs for, for uh, power status, and that's basically it. A lot of test points in here if you want to get your scope out and get in here. I will warn you though, the plus 12 volts is right next to an FPGA input, so if your scope slips like mine did, no more FPGA input. So be careful. The Atlas backplane, uh, this is the status of what we produced so far. Uh, 400 bare board shipped by Eric, and this was actually before Tapper got involved. And uh, Eric actually donated the use of his dining room table for uh, at least a couple weeks to do this. And there's, there are pictures up on the web that uh, it was pretty am amusing, I think. I think it, uh, the, the agreement with Tapper came at the right time because he might be divorced by now if he hadn't had that agreement. Anyway, 300 additional boards were shipped, were produced and shipped by Tapper. All 700 of these were sold out in, by the 15th of May, which is, this is notice this date, so that's about date and time, right? So we produced an additional 300 boards at Tapper. And where did they go? 142 of them have been sold as of today, well, as of a few days ago. And it, Originally, the boards were set, were built by themselves, offered, here's the board, you guys go be, get the parts. And then Tapper said, well, you know, if you got a board, you're probably gonna want sockets to plug things in, that's pretty useful. So Tapper put together a kit. So Tapper sold 653 parts kits. 
So out of the, what, 1,000 boards that there are here, 653 of them have parts kits that are sitting on the shelf or soldered onto them. So the status is now we have over 150 boards and parts kits still available. These are easy because when we run out, we just buy another run of 100 boards and we can buy the parts in low volume and it's, it's not really a big deal. So you don't have to be panicked that there's only 150. More will be forthcoming. As you can see up here, there are several builds that happen. Okay, the extender board, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. It's pretty trivially simple. Uh, generally not needed, but you never know. 200 were built. Originally 20 were built by Lyle, 200 more were built by Eric. They were transferred to Tapper. This is about the time the Tapper got involved. All 200 of these were sold by May last year, and 200 additional boards are produ have been produced, and 85 of those have been sold already. So you've got uh, 115 boards or so left. Okay, this is the USB gateway. Now pretty much if you want to talk to your computer on any other HPSDR boards, you have to have this board. USB connector up here in the corner, Atlas bus down the bottom, uh, FPGA for uh, running FIFOs and talking to the USB interface chip, which is up here. So basically the, USB, the FPGA sits between the USB interface and the Atlas bus. Alpha One boards funded by developers in 2006. Again, late in 2006, Alpha Two boards were funded by Tapper. And it's, you can see about when Tapper got involved here in 2006. Then a production run of 650 was made. These are the boards that you have because there's only been one run. And uh, we uh, bought a few extra boards just in case because this is going to be needed by most everyone that uses HPSDR. So approximately 550 have assembled and tested boards have been sold as of today. So there's about 100 left and we have about 290 bare boards. So when these sell out, it's undetermined what's going to happen with another build, but there still will be bare boards. So you can still roll your own if you're uh, so inclined. You have to be really inclined, too. Okay, Janice, this is the sound card. And uh, basically, uh, same thing. We got an Atlas bus down here. We got a CPLD in here. And I don't forget where it is. I can't see too well. I think this may be the codec here. 192 kilosample per second. Codec that uh, provides you audio in and out, and uh, let's see, the AKM chip I think is up here. It's, we also have uh, the, the the AKM codec is a very high performance audio band codec. It it's in it appears in the highest performance sound cards. I believe um, the Delta 44 uses this chip. Okay, again the same kind of schedule you can see, and we actually the production run of 650 was made at the same time as the Aussie board, so that was a fun year. Fun time. This is, and of course, you notice the date again. It's the oh my god, Dayton's next month. But it was more like oh my god, Dayton's five months away. Let's get going. This is when it was completed, just in time. So again, 650 symbol tested, 350 bare boards, and we also bought some extra VCXOs because those are basically unobtainium for individual users that want just one. Okay, approximately 520 have been sold. So we have about 130 left, and uh, we also have some spare boards. Okay, now we get to the transmitter, which is more recent memory, this last year at Dayton. By the way, maybe I should describe it a little bit. It's only a half watt transmitter. Uh, uses a uh, cell phone chip to do the transmission, and the infamous three toroids that I won't get into now. And. Thanks to Phil, I don't have to wind any more toroids on the receiver. Okay, a little bit later, this is the next board in line. Uh, some people ask, well, why'd you do the transmitter before you did the receiver? Well, I don't know, because it was there, because maybe it was easier. Again, since these came later, these are funded by Tapper. Production run of 350 made in April 2008. Approximately 340 have been sold. So, there's only 10 left. So keep that in mind when you're buying your boards. Time is short for uh, Penelope. OK, now the most exciting board so far, I think, is uh, this board. And I feel kind of uh, strange up here talking about this board when uh, Phil Harmon is in the audience, who was the project leader for this. But. Uh, 
He's done a great job on this, but it did take us a little bit of time to do this. And you know what? I'm a digital guy, so I don't do this RF stuff very well. Digital is easy. This RF, this is hard. So this took us a few iterations to get right. We got it mostly right, but there were a few tweaks that we had to do. And the performance is phenomenal. So when you start getting down into minus 130, minus 140 dBm, you can't just hook up the wires and hope that it works. You have to think about grounding and shielding and what you're going to do if and did you bypass everything. And I'll get into a little bit about a problem that we had that was not really too obvious at the time. But after we looked at it, after we did it, we say, oh, pff, dummy, why did we do that? So this is the first lash up and aptly named lash up because this is the LTC evaluation board that has the 2208 on it, a 2208 on it, and it's lashed up to the connector on top of an Aussie board, which is kind of hidden underneath here. And now the FPGA on the Aussie board is a little bit smaller than the one that's on the Penelope board or on the Mercury board. So to fit all of the code, all the initial Aussie code plus all the receiver code took up 95% of the FPGA. So that's pretty impressive that Phil could fit all that in one FPGA and do all the testing, pre-board testing with a lash up. It was clocked at 125 megahertz. Well, it's caused some problem with power SDR because it expects a multiple of 192 kilohertz for its sample rate. So it worked, but you get some pops and you get some, some disconnects. So we opted on the future run to uh, switch this frequency to a multiple of 192 kilohertz. I believe it's, we use 640 times, so it's 122.88 megahertz, the standard frequency of 122.88. Okay, uh, on the uh, Alpha 1 board, you know, a couple things to notice, the large heat sink on here. That ADC, when it's running at frequency, gets hot. And if you don't keep it cool, bad things happen. And not just burn up type things, but your performance really, uh, goes down the bad path. Okay, and you see these inductors right here? These are part of the low pass filter between the preamp, which is this little guy right here, and the ADC. Air wound inductor coils. And then the large input transformer here. It's, the flow is from the antenna, which you can kind of see the very end of it. It flows to the left. And the preamp in this circuit is all, in this board is always in circuit, 20 dB preamp. Okay, and this is alpha two. Now notice that there's no heat sink here. Well, we fixed the problem with the heat dissipation. What you don't see underneath here is a pad that is almost the size of this part and another likewise pad on the back of the board with 64 vias in between each. So now we've got some uh, good heat sinking. Uh, notice that the, the air wand inductors are gone. We're using chip inductors now. And the somewhat similar transformer, it's a little bit smaller, but uh, You'll we'll see this morphs a little bit more. And these headers here, these were an attempt by us to switch out the preamp. This header down here was for the coil driver for the relay. And the idea was you would make a little daughter card that would snap on here, plug on these three headers, and then you could switch the preamp in and out under software control. Well, it didn't quite work out as well as we'd hoped. We had a lot of problems with that because running it, first of all, that moved the preamp further away. If I can go back here, you can see the difference in distance here. This slide is really kind of crunched here, but the, the filtering is in between the preamp and the A to D. And to fit in these headers, you have to move it further away. So that caused too many problems, so that got ripped out. Preamp's right next to the ADC now, and what we did is we put a, a t an attenuator that switched in by this relay. So, so now this is done, the preamp's always in circuit, and you have a 20 dB attenuator you switch in to cancel out the 20 dB of gain by the amplifier. So basically, it's a preamp canceller, okay? So we call it preamp on and off, but that's kind of a misnomer. The preamp's always on, but the gain is what gets changed. And notice now that the transformer, that big transformer, that's this little thing right here. And this is an additional filter that goes in line between the antenna and the preamp here. And notice, I don't have to wind any toroids. These are all purchased parts.
So I'm happy, thanks Phil. Okay, quick specs on Mercury. I tried to get this up on one slide, and I, I think I succeeded here. So it's kind of an eye chart, but all the pertinent specs are all on one slide, so I don't have to page you through them. And if you can take a look at these, it's pretty impressive. Okay, MDS, minus 138 dBm with the preamp on, 118 with, minus 118 with the preamp off. And uh, if, if you've got lots of technical questions, Phil Harmon is here. He'd be happy to talk to you and explain to you how he did this. Yeah. <laughs> He's keeping score back there. I'm way down. Okay. Where are we with Mercury? Alpha 1, March 2008. Alpha 2, July 2008. Alpha 3, August 2008. So you can see we've been busy here. Even though it might look like nothing's happening, things are happening. And if you've been on the web lately, you notice that the interest list has opened up for Mercury. We have a price up there, and we have a place where you can sign up to show your interest. And what uh, Tapper does is we want to find out how many of these to build. And of course, the more we build, the cheaper they are. This is, the price is based on a build of 500. If we can't get close to 500, between 4 and 500 signed up, then we're going to have to adjust the price, perhaps. So I think we'll do it. Uh, I looked this morning, and there were nearly 300 signed up, and it's been open for one week. So I think we're going to make our 400 to 425 that we need. However, if more people sign up, then we can increase the build size. So that helps give a little cushion for new people to come in. Anyway, we're estimating 500 that are going to be built uh, November, December this year. And uh, you can sign up. This is the address, www.hamsdr.com. And you do need the www. So, so interest list will be open through October 5th. You can order from Tapper starting sometime after that, once we determine what the quantities actually are going to be built. And estimated delivery is going to be the middle of December, barring any parts that I can't get, which can happen. But the Penelope was just a miracle that we made Dayton last year. So we're hoping that, that we won't have that problem this year. Now for Mercury, now on to uh, Alex, which is the RF preselector. And again, we have an example of this in the demonstration room. Uh, this pretty much, in addition to the previous boards I mentioned, completes a one-half watt full SDR. This was really a nightmare to try to put on only one or two slides because this board set does so much. It's a two-board set, separate receive high-pass and transmit low-pass filter boards. Uh, they're 160 by 100 millimeter standard Euro card, and, and uh, Graham, the designer, picked these because they fit into an off-the-shelf housing. These do not plug into Atlas the Atlas bus. They're separate, external housing. They're run by SPI bus, and we have an SPI port right on Mercury. So the cable plugs right on. If you're using an SDR, HP SDR box, you're all set. Run a ribbon cable right over. Power requirement, which is supplied over that same ribbon cable, or you can supply it externally, is 180 milliamps based upon if you picked all the relays and all, turned on all the LEDs. It can also operate standalone if you uh, can talk to it with SPI. That's how you control it. SPI is basically clock, data, and select line, a separate select line for each board. So it's a pretty simple interface. Very low insertion loss, less than 2 dB on receive paths, paths or half a dB on transmit paths. And importantly, it doesn't degrade the IP3 of Mercury. They worked really hard on this because you'd be a real shame to get this really awesome SDR, high performance, then stick a filter on it that the way the cores saturate or you. And there are no, there's not a processor in this box. So there's no continuously running oscillator that you can pick up with your minus 140 dBm sensitive receiver. Okay, and here's a block diagram of the transmitter. Looks like I skipped a slide here. Okay, this is the transmit, the features on the transmit board. And I'll go through this real quick, and then I want you to look at the diagram, because you guys will get way more out of that than I could. This is just my poor attempt at verbalizing here. But you've got four external BNCs, so you can hook three external antennas up, and then you've got an RF out to the transmitter, or actually it's in from the transmitter. So your antennas and your Penelope board. There's an internal connection that goes to the RX board, and you'll see what that's for in a second. It also has forward and reverse log amps on board, so you can actually measure forward and reverse power, and those signals are in the ribbon cable, so you can use Power SDR or whatever software to actually measure forward and reverse power that's going through your Alex board. So if you put a PA in between your Penelope transmitter 
and the Alex set of boards, you'll measure the actual power that you get out of your PA, and forward and reverse. Okay, we have uh, unswitched low pass, low pass filter. It stays in line all the time. This is an, helps with you with anti-aliasing problems. Uh, one of seven relay selectable elements, so you've got all the standard uh, bands here, plus you have a bypass, in case you want to put it in bypass and put your own filters in. Also incorporates TR antenna switching, and it's rated at 100 watts, so a uh, little room for an amplifier for Penelope. Okay, so here's the picture. Here is your seven switchable filters, your bypass. You've got the six meter filter right here. Uh, TR switching is here. And your three antenna connections here. And this comes from the receiver board. Or should I say goes to the receiver board because it's really meant to run these antennas over to where your receiver's gonna connect. And that's a picture of the alpha. Okay, now the receiver board. <sighs> internal SMB to the transmitter board, and then you've got five external BNCs. You can hook transverter up here. You can hook up extra receive antennas, like beverage antennas, for instance. Or you have an output here, pardon me, you have an output here that you can break the connection between this SMB and the filters, and you can insert your own preamp or your own filter, because we don't know what you're going to want to do. So maybe you're going to want to bypass all this and put in your own preamp, or bypass it and put in your own custom filter. So you can do that with these connections. Also has four relay switchable attenuators. It has two attenuators, a 10 and a 20, so you can have bypass the 10, the 20, or both. So you get four settings. And you get seven relay selectable series elements, and you get a six meter low nose amplifier in the 50 megahertz position. It's a 20 dB gain amplifier. And yet another, uh, always in line anti-aliasing filter. And here's the block diagram here. This dotted di line here goes to the other board. And there's the picture. A little uh, distorted, but there it is. Okay, so where we are with Alex. Alpha One funded by developers again. This was uh, mostly the project leader, uh, Graham, is also in the audience here, so talk to him about this. It's uh, Great job that he did on this. Took him a long time, but it, I think it's worth it because it has a lot of good features. Alpha 2 funded by Tapper in January of 2008. Alpha 3, which is what you see out there, is funded in March 2008. These are the completion dates, by the way, not the funding dates. Okay, and we're talking about uh, producing these, and uh, other than me threatening to run off to uh, Innovet or something because I might have to wind toroids, <laughs> This, uh, we're estimating uh, beginning of the year for this. And we're discussing fully assembled versus partial kit, and this has mostly to do with the toroids because they're really expensive to get them wound. So since uh, the user's slave labor is very cheap, we might let the user do this. But then it lets some people out because while some people adamantly insist they have to build it, some people don't want to build it. They just want to use it. They, believe me, there's plenty of things to challenge you without having to solder things. And there is an enclosure that will be available because it's a commercial enclosure. That's uh, what, why the board size was picked the way, way it was. So production is TBD, and we're still working on the enclosure. The enclosure will most likely be available separately, and we're working on custom screen end panels, so it'll actually the connectors will be labeled, which is going to be good because there's like nine of them on there. Okay, so I wanted to to go over a little bit on the evolution of uh, Alex because it's kind of indicative of what we go through and why it takes a year and a half to do some of these projects other than we all have day jobs and we're volunteers. This info is given to me by Graham and it's kind of a humorous uh, account of the evolution of Alex from the beginning. It started out as a simple board layout that Phil put out a request for on the HPSDR reflector. Oh, well, we need a pre-selector for Mercury, so can somebody who can do a simple board layout, maybe they can come forward and they can do a one weekend project and we'll, we'll have a board, a pre-selector board. So this, the hook now is set. So uh, Graham volunteers and starts doing some research, working with Phil, compares some of the other designs and uh, some of the other designs either couldn't meet the IP3, I think Pick a Star falls in that category, or while excellent designs, the physical 
and cost constraints were too high. So you can't, you don't want to have a little bitty board set and then a big bunch of filters in die cast boxes that cost three times as much as the entire system. So they really, these two items that they looked at, designs they looked at, couldn't meet the requirements. So now, guess what? Now you have to do your own pre-selector design and uh, instead of just laying out a board, now it's, it's subtly become a design now. It's not just a board layout. So now next month rolls by and then you, fi you find out with a little analysis that, well, uh, non-resonant filters provide better IP3 with small cores than resonant ones. Well, we also need low pass filters, so now we need multi-band selectable filters. So now we're gonna have not just a pre-selector, but low pass filters for the transmitter. Next month, now you figure out, gee, well that won't fit on one board unless it's that big. Well, that's not gonna be any good. We gotta fit it in a standard enclosure. Okay, well now we got two boards. So now, I guess I should go back one here. So now you notice that it started out as a one weekend lay out the board project. Now it's two boards, one board with low pass filters, one board with high pass filters, design involved, interconnect involved, enclosure involved over a period of what, uh, like from February to June, so about four months. In July then, thinking that they had this down, what we're gonna do, they put out a call in the reflector saying, okay, well, uh, what do you guys think of this? Well, here's what they thought. Well, I gotta have a six meter preamp. Oh, I need switchable attenuators, that'd be nice. And how about if I have multiple antennas? What do I do there? And uh, what, uh, TR switching would be a great place to put this because now you got the antennas in there and the preamp and all the filters. And well, and you ought to measure SWR if you're gonna have all your antennas running through there. And you know, make sure you have that nice housing because it's a two PC board set. It doesn't plug into Atlas now and you don't want all this 100 watts of RF laying out on your bench and being unshielded to go into your minus 140 dBm front end. So the feature creep got rampant here. However, when you look at this, I mean, they're all good ideas. You want all these things. It's just that now poor Graham is stuck with doing all of these uh, things in one weekend. Okay, so, and you know, we all, how many of you guys love relays? Oh, there's always one guy, you know, two guys. <laughs> Anyway, good idea, let's get rid of the relays. Let's use solid state switches because we don't have any moving parts then and that'd be much great, much better. Well, uh, it didn't quite work because the relays have too high losses and especially when you end up going through a TR relay and then antenna selection relay and then a filter selection relay. Now you got, thank you. You got like four relay paths you gotta go through. So, but no, not that, notwithstanding that, they went ahead and tried it with these and said, oh, well, that didn't work. So we measure the loss, doesn't work. So did it once, now you get to do it again. And you're the expert, so you're the likely candidate to do it again since you did it the first time. So Alpha 2 was built in January, it took out the relays, it took out the Hittite switches and put in relays, and lo and behold, now we have parasitic problems detuning the six meter low pass filter so we still don't quite have it right. So now you did it twice and you get to do it again. April 2008, now, finally, we're getting close here. We adjusted the layout, or, or uh, I guess uh, Graham adjusted the layout and with the changes to prevent this detuning here, and we added a few things for manufacturability like changing the cable to an IDC mass terminated type so it's a little cheaper and uh, various things like that, made it play better with the HPSDR system. Okay, so now, we built and extensively tested several units, did we get it right? Well, yeah we did, now you've gotta document it because we wanna build lots of these. And now design and testing is done, but, welcome to toroid hell. There are 38 of them on the two boards. And those of you who are at Dayton know how much I love toroids. And if you do the math, that's 9,500 toroids. So I wanna see volunteers now, do I see anybody? Man, not even the guy who likes relays. <laughs> so that's not gonna fly. That, that you'll get the board sometime in, in 2012. About in time for WARC 2012, you get these boards, if I had to do this. And incidentally, I went to the toroid guy 
figuring that, well, maybe I could get him to do these. You know, the guy that does the, uh, some of the Elecraft ones for the kits, he told me it would take him two years to do this. So I guess that's out. Anyway, we've got a plan to handle that. You'll be seeing that soon. We're uh, probably going to have to go offshore to do it, but I think we can get it done at a reasonable cost. So uh, that's about it for my technical. I would like to especially thank Phil for all the work he's done on Mercury and on Alex, and Lyle Johnson, who did the layout on Mercury, and Graham Haddock, who is, and unfortunately Lyle's not here, but Phil and Graham are here. Graham did the uh, Alex board set, and put in lots of hours on these, and I think came up with an excellent product. And I have something, uh, additionally, Eric, on the tapper board, who's been tireless in his uh, cheerleading efforts to light a fire under all of us and get us going, get things rolling forward. And John Coster, who if you've bought any of these boards, you've talked to John because he runs a tapper office and he's here also. And all of you HPSDR users, all of you guys that buy boards and use them and then come back and contribute on the HPSDR list and learn and help others to learn. And I'd like to end with one, a little anecdote here. And uh, when I was working at, uh, years ago at Motorola in the uh, CAD lab, the software guys had come in. And I remember this is the lab, this is the CAD guys that lay out boards. They hung a sign up on the post. The software guys came in and did this and said, software makes hardware happen. And this was just kind of like a little slap to us hardware guys and saying, ha, well, you know, without us guys, you would just have a hunk of steel, you know, and that wouldn't be worth anything. So I would like to especially thank Bill Tracy, who is in the back here, who is our software guru from HPSDR. You guys and me and all of us would have a hunk of iron without Bill's help. So I really want to especially thank him. And then I'll show you the sign that we hung up underneath the software guy sign in the lab. And there you go. <laughs> So here's more information. You can go to uh, hpsdr.org for more technical information. Uh, you can sign up at hamsdr.com to show your interest in buying the boards. Boards will be available. The new ones will be available. The old ones are available at tapper.org. So thank you very much. How many transmits watts does your filter board handle? Handles 100 watts peak. Uh, just a hint of where you might find a suitable power, 100-watt uh, exciter that you... Yeah, that's a good question. Other than going on to the QRP sites and looking online to find some, like, MOSFET-based amplifiers, and I, unfortunately, I don't have a URL with me. I have found some half-watt to one-watt in, 30-watt out amplifiers for reasonable prices. I think that same website has up to a 100-watt amplifier. It, it's going to cost you a couple hundred dollars. And there's rumblings about the amplifier called Thor. Uh, you've seen the, uh, on the list, interest list the big amplifier, the 600 watt one. But that's going to be pretty expensive and kind of like still being discussed. So yeah, there's room for that. So if you're an RF guy and you want to design a power amp, join HPSDR. Come see me. We'd like to talk to you. No, oh, you forgot. Software makes hardware late. <laughs> yeah, and, and see, we also have a saying where I work is that the last guy who gets it is the guy who's responsible for it being late. So my, my hardware's done. <laughs> there you go. Um, are the transmit filters band pass or low pass? The transmit filters are low pass, but what you can do is gang them with the high pass filters on the receive board, and so you end up getting band pass for receive and low pass mm -hmm. for transmit. Okay, the reason I'm asking is um, in multi-transmitter stations, um, getting rid of out-of-band energy is really important, both below and above. And um, it, that, was the, that was the source of the question. Okay. Thank you.